Forget gurus. Forget anyone claiming to be an online business expert without going through the challenges of entrepreneurship themselves. The Real Money, Real Business podcast is here to prove the best insights in online business comes from your fellow online business builders. We dig into stories of entrepreneurs selling their business on the Empire Flippers marketplace so that you can learn how they made their business profitable, how they overcame obstacles, and what lessons they learned in their online journey. If you want to take your business and your knowledge to the next level, you've come to the right podcast. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Craig here with another great business to discuss on this episode of the Real Money, Real Business podcast. Today's guest is Lauren, and she's selling her e-commerce and Amazon FBM business on the Empire Philippers Marketplace. So welcome to the show, Lauren. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to talking more about your business. But before we dive in, let's go over a brief summary of the business. It's an e-commerce and Amazon FBM business in the pet care niche, created in April 2012. The average monthly revenue for the business is $450,170, and it makes an average of $94,858 net profit each month. For everyone listening, you can visit empireflippers.com forward slash marketplace and search for listing 51414 to learn more about the business, or you can unlock this listing to start your due diligence if you're interested in purchasing this asset. So now that I've given a general overview of the business, let's have a look at what's included in the sale. We have the domain including all site content and files, six additional domains used as 301 redirects, an Amazon Seller Central account with 84 SKUs, a trademark, SOPs, supply contracts and relationships, email list with 16,000 subscribers, and social media accounts with Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. It's important to note that inventory is not usually included in the list price, but further details can be provided to active buyers, and buyers should have an active VAT number in all UK and EU countries where this business has inventory stored before the transfer can finalise. It's highly recommended to begin the VAT registration process as soon as possible. Okay, Lauren, now let's hear from you. Can you tell us a little about your background in building and running online businesses? Yeah, sure. I joined the business around eight years ago. I didn't have any prior experience in e-commerce or management, really, but had just come out of university at the time, and it was a family-run business. So from there, I started really in a customer service role here in the office and have steadily kind of taken over more of a managerial role. And now as MD, really keep an eye on the overview of all the operations relating to the running of the company. Okay, excellent stuff. So as a family-run business, and you were sort of introduced in... I guess you were given some experience gradually, which is, I guess, a good way to learn. So with this business model, you earn from e-commerce and FBM. Can you tell us a little about how those two monetizations work together and sort of what the sort of revenue split is between them both? Yeah, sure. So off the top of my head, I think our e-commerce is the smallest, but only slightly. Amazon makes up the bulk of that when our European sites are online, which they have been off for the early part of this year. They've just gone back online, which is more of a career issue given the Brexit situation. So Amazon makes up the bulk of our traffic um, when, like I say, when those European ones are included. And that is FBM, as you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And how come it was it that your family decided on this niche? Is it something that you're particularly specialised in? Was it because of the it was a trending niche or something like that? Yeah, it was. We kind of fell into it, I suppose. I would describe our niche as kind of hobby and lifestyle. The pet care kind of falls into that because of the the specific type of animal, I suppose, that we do the pet housing for. I think there's been a bit of a focus on a kind of sustainable and eco living and kind of accidentally fell into it as that market started to grow. We've seen pretty big uptake and interest in that niche. And prior to us finding our brand where we are now with, I would say, quite a cohesive range of products, it was far more broad. We were importing what we could sell, essentially. And over the years and trial and error, that's narrowed down into what we are now. Okay, and I noticed that you have a strong history of sales on the German, French and Italian marketplaces. Can you tell us when you started selling on the marketplaces? Tell us a bit about what happened there and sort of, yeah, just give a buyer an idea of what happened there. Okay, sure. So as I started, we were just kind of making inroads into those marketplaces through, at the time, only Amazon. And we've seen the popularity of our products increase there year on year. And right up to 
I think 2020, there was a slight break with the German platform as we got our VAT number sorted, which was sorted and we now have that. And then all over last year, we had our sales increasing all across those marketplaces. Um, we could deliver there really quite easily. And then Brexit happened and along with a number of other issues with our couriers and the, the kind of seamless of the customer experience, it just became quite difficult. So we pulled out of those markets whilst we got that sorted. Thankfully, we've seen sales kind of continue to increase here. We've had a really, really good spring and it looks like everything is now back on track and we've just fired up our seller central accounts for those three European markets. It was this morning. I did it, in fact. So I think there might be a slightly slow uptake. We've had to incorporate the duty costs because we're now going to pay them before the goods leave. So we're hoping that will offer a really seamless experience in getting back there quite quickly. So, yeah, we're hoping to see those start increasing really from today. Excellent. Yeah, that's a good opportunity for a buyer to consider to use what you've already built to take advantage of those marketplaces. Um, yeah, so it also mentions on your listing that you carry out your own logistics with the UK courier. Could you tell us a little about the sort of inventory fulfillment that is behind this business? Yeah, so we have our own warehouse. Our offices are based there as well. I'm not exactly sure of the square footage, actually. So I think it's a relatively small warehouse that we, we operate out of. And then all of our sales that come in through our various sites, so eBay, Amazon and our own website, we have just an order management software. Our labels are printed each morning and they go out with our courier. So they collect once a day and they are then delivered across the UK within 24 hours to 48 hours. And that's how we fulfill all of our orders currently. OK, and I guess you have some employees to handle some of those operations. Could you tell us a little about what they do for the business? Yeah, absolutely. We're a relatively small team. We have one full-time warehouse staff with occasional help through kind of temporary agency staff when we're unloading containers. That's how we purchase our products. They come in by a container from the Far East, two to three a week in peak season, slightly less, I would say, in winter. So we have one full-time warehouse and then offices are run with an IT staff member who is full-time. And we currently have two customer service staff who are, who are half-time, really. And I think there is scope for the three office space members that I've just mentioned. So IT and customer service to be scaled right back. We've really made ourselves quite efficient in the past few years. And I think out of, I'd probably describe it, a sense of loyalty. Those employees have worked here, most of them for at least 10 years. And they're kind of family friends. So we were reluctant to scale back if we didn't have to. But I think in terms of advertising it, they're not necessary, especially if a buyer already had their own operations in place. I think they would absorb customer service side of it and the IT side of it easily. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So how come is it that you're selling the business at this point? I suppose when I joined, we was a slightly larger team family-wise. My parents, who had originally started the company, were, were still on board. My mum did a lot of the accounting at the time. My dad was on hand with a lot of the product development. And I also had a sibling that was involved in the company. And since then, that my brother has left and my parents have retired. So I'm left on my own and it's probably a little bit too big a beast for me with a, my own kind of young family. So we've all had the discussion in it that we think it's the right time to sell. And that frees us all up to go and do, do as we please elsewhere. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Is there anything you've learned from this business that you would potentially apply to future businesses? Yeah, I would say I think the most important foundation of a product based business is exactly that. It's the products. Um, it's ensuring that the item that you're choosing to sell and advertise, you know, satisfies the customer and ensures your brand keeps its place in the marketplace through, you know, positive reviews and kind of an understanding of what that brand stands for over and above your competitors. Yeah, absolutely. In the competitive market, it's no doubt that product quality is becoming increasingly more and more important. Is there anything you tried when growing this business sort of didn't work out for you? I wouldn't say didn't work and necessarily was a failure. I think if there's anything I've kind of taken away from it, it's again, it comes back to, I would say, what I think works, which is the flip side of that is it's sometimes easy to think of increasing margins by making cuts on products. And I just don't think in terms of longevity, that holds up. I think you've really got to make the foundation being a really great product. And if anything, use budget to kind of show that through advertising and brand awareness and that gives you an edge over your competitors i think and allows a better price point and that's really where attention should be focused yeah as for the advertising what do you currently do in terms of marketing for this business very little really there was a time we did more print-based advertising in some of the magazines that were really linked they're kind of more hobby magazines linked to some of our products and this is going back 
probably four or five years and it never really amounted to much but at the time probably the place you went to if you were advertising in the last year we have started to use kind of Facebook advertising and we do have good results but we're usually in control of our sales that we're never in a position to really push our sales like that we rather keep a relatively stable amount of stock coming in and keep our price high as opposed to pushing through advertising and selling more so just kind of making ourselves as efficient as possible before being in a position to kind of scale. So in terms of advertising, to get the numbers you've spoken about with our business, advertising, I think, makes up for most of the data you've got there, less than a thousand in some month. Certainly 2019, it was probably nothing. Again, there's a really good scope there. If someone has the ability to scale and use advertising to do that, then I think there's a lot of options there. Yeah, so advertising is one sort of avenue for growth for a buyer could consider. What do you think are the other major opportunities for growth with this business? I think if I wasn't interested to stay, I think I would have to realistically look at um, streamlining our staff. I think I wouldn't be able to avoid it at the minute I'm doing it. I know, I know we're, we're hoping to sell, but I think that would further make the business really more efficient, kind of outsourcing probably customer service staff and, and probably warehousing. Because we have the building, it's never made sense to do it. But I think we would probably look at that if we were looking long term. I think developing maybe yearly a new product But in terms of that, we have a really stable product range. We don't really add to it very often and we don't really need to. And I think that's something that's quite enjoyable about this business is you're never running away from yourself with trying to stay ahead of trends. It's about keeping that product range really solid, really well designed at a high quality. And I think that's what we would focus on. We would look at maybe extending some of the ranges that we've had some really good results from earlier this year, our kind of gardening kind of lifestyle range is really starting to pick up a little bit on the scope there and we, we would probably focus on that for next spring okay that's interesting to know that there's a sort of another i guess shoulder niche that someone could explore and that you've already seen that's doing well yeah so what about in terms of the owners of the business what sort of is your involvement what's your sort of day-to-day tasks look like so i would say on a personal level, I probably involve myself slightly too much, which is habit. In an ideal world, I'll delegate more, which is more of a, my personality issue, I would say. In terms of running through the day-to-day running, I have little to no involvement in customer service. That's handled by, by staff, either remotely or in the office, depending on, on who it is we're talking about. Our accounting is outsourced. I review that kind of monthly. I have monthly management reports and I cast my eye over that. But as long as everything's going in the right direction, it doesn't take up too much of my time. Again, I look at kind of adverts, page position, where we're kind of sitting compared to our competitors. I cast my eye over that probably once or twice a week out of curiosity more than necessity, I think. But my main job is liaising with our Chinese agent um, to kind of forecast our shipping schedule for the, the next kind of three to four months. We, we only work with a small number of suppliers, probably four, and we place orders, kind of sets out the next four to five months worth of, of orders. And once they're set, we make minor tweaks depending on if a product is selling really, really well or we need to slow things down slightly. But that would be the bulk of my job, really, is just checking in with our our Chinese side um, and ensuring that everything looks kind of set for the coming months to stop kind of inwards. Okay. And what skills or requirements do you think there are for someone who's not familiar with this niche or business model? I would say that specific skills for the niche aren't really a requirement. They're probably really easy to learn I think it's just having a really good understanding of the product and of the competitors which I think kind of goes for any brand kind of product based brand I think once you've got a really good handle on that you've you've kind of got the bones of it and then understanding seasonality of those products so it's more becoming an expert in the product range which like thankfully ours is fairly small but I don't think there's a there's a special skill set um other than being fairly good at business I would say and having that bigger understanding of margins you know streamlining a business and making it as profitable as possible so yeah I think nothing specific whatever has kept if a buyer is coming to the table to look at it going to be keenly interested in business I would think I would think they would have a lot of the tools already to put themselves in that position where they're looking to buy so yeah just experience in a product-based company would be all you can really need I think yeah, just knowing e-commerce in general, and I guess Amazon as well, understanding their policies and stuff, a basic understanding of that would be pretty helpful too. Excellent stuff. So, but what do you think are the biggest risks with this business that a buyer should be aware of? 
The biggest risks, I would say, is taking your eye off the ball with competitors and probably quality of the product. I think if you are keeping on top of where you sit in the marketplace, keeping ahead of what competitors are doing and ensuring the product you're bringing in, you know, you remains at the quality customers expect, you're going to be OK. As ever with any e-commerce business, especially ones which use marketplaces, you know, you need to stay within the regulations and the metrics that they demand in order to keep that page position. So that remains a risk. But again, that comes back to product quality, customer service and keeping an eye on your competitor. And as long as they're covered, I think the risks remain pretty small. Yeah, so the, the general risks that come with e-commerce or Amazon-based businesses, there's nothing else so there to worry about too much. Okay, so great stuff. Putting yourself in the shoes of a buyer, why do you think this is a business worth buying? I think a business worth buying because it'll offer a really great introduction if they're not into a product-based business. I think we have a really great compact range that's well-established in a brand that people trust here in the UK and also, you know, in three European marketplaces via our direct site as well as Amazon. So I think we're a ready-made package for somebody if they're based in that niche or want to be in that niche, then that's great. But it would also be a great bolt-on for a number of other niches. Like I said, we're we are pet care predominantly, our pet housing products, but we do venture into garden and outdoor products as well. And they all tie into a kind of eco sustainable lifestyle niche. So there is a real great potential if someone is in that industry to bolt this on as a already profitable business with great positionings on Amazon, eBay and our own our own e-commerce site. But yeah, I think the opportunities are really big. Products can be developed, ranges can be developed and always quite simply as well. Many of our products are actually quite similar they might have tweaks and features that you know specific sets of customers are interested in but when we say redesign a product that doesn't mean a huge r&d team need to work on it it's simply looking at how can we make this slightly better a customer saying anything about it can we tweak it and actually our suppliers work really really well with us for developing products it's usually a really simple process to to come up with a prototype and a sample and then and there's a new product to launch so i think there's a real amount of potential like I say, either for someone who has no standing in this niche or who wants to bolt it onto their own. Yeah, it's a really new brand company, I feel. We're, we're quite small and put that many hours in to get the numbers that, that are there on kind of dashboard here. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential and I hopefully people will see that. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with a brand that's been established for this amount of time and it's not easy to build a long-standing brand like that. Just to sort of back a bit, final question uh, about the business. You have the e-commerce site, the store. Where do you get most of your traffic from for that store? It's largely organically. We have a relatively small but really well-engaged Instagram page. So we don't have many followers, but those that we do really engage with us. Well, we have a email subscription list, but our e-commerce site generally comes from people searching for our kind of keyword, if you like. So the products that we sell, they find us that way. We don't do, like I said, a huge amount of advertising to get that revenue through our e-commerce site. So it is brand awareness and just having a, a good website. All right. So regarding the sale of this business, would you commit to a non-compete? Yes, we'd be happy to do that. And how much support are you willing to offer buyers? Are you going for the standard 30 days of email and Skype support? I think we've agreed to 45. I think that's shown on the listing, which I'm quite happy to do through However, the buyer feels they need assisting, really, whether that's through video calls, telecommunication, you know, guides that can be written. I think it's a relatively short amount of time to hand over from my perspective to ensure that person gets everything they need to get running. So, yeah, I think that's 45 days is no problem for me. And I would do everything they needed in that time. Yeah, I mean, that's extra support than our sellers usually offer. So it's, it's really great to know that a buyer will get that extra support from you. And are you open to negotiating something like an earnout? That's not up for discussion at the minute. We're not planning on that now. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to share that I might have missed? I don't think so. I think you've covered everything there. Yeah, hopefully that your listeners will agree that it's a, it's a nice little package. And we're obviously keen to start talking to buyers to, to discuss you know, any questions that they have directly. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time, Lauren. It's been great talking to you. Great. Thank you for your time. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. To learn more and see if this listing has already been sold, head over to empireflippers.com forward slash marketplace and search for listing 51414. If you're watching this on YouTube, click the link in the description to go straight to the listing. Once you've unlocked this listing, you'll be given everything you need to know about this business. So until next time, enjoy your digital journey.